Hello and welcome along to another episode. Uh, it's that time of the year. It's a bit of a frosty morning this morning and uh, I think most people in Ireland and the UK would be getting to that stage where we're fully housed. Uh, there's no more grazing. So uh, for those in New Zealand and uh, in other parts of the world, uh, this is what happens. There's uh, stock come inside and uh, we, don't, we don't graze anymore. Uh, until probably the young stock might get out in January and the cows might get out in February. So uh, just on this place, one of my clients' places here, um, already the the uh, in-calf heifers are uh, housed in here, looking pretty phenomenal. Um, so over the next 12 months, I'm going to be doing quite a bit of uh, looking at nitrogen use. So. The mainstream advice in this country seems to be that clover is going to be the saving grace for us. Um, there is no hope without clover and for those of you that know me know that I'm, I'm a huge supporter of clover but we don't just use it for nitrogen uh, mobilisation. So what clover does is it more efficiently mobilises atmospheric nitrogen. So the air we breathe is about 74% 74, 74 nitrogen. Um, and so we're trying to find ways to mobilize that to be available for the plants and clover does that very efficiently but clover has a lot of other advantages but in a year like 2023 where we started off so poorly we got very little use from clover um, so there's a lot of other things we can do to uh, reduce nitrogen use um, a lot of my clients have reduced nitrogen by over 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare and they're still growing similar tons of dry matter. So the big thing is that I find that people are getting really onto this uh, bandwagon of, of clover. They've reduced their nitrogen use and they've actually suffered and they've grown a couple of ton of dry matter per hectare less. So we need to look at the impacting factors and I want to start this whole nitrogen view by looking back at 2023 and looked at what happened and, and why our nitrogen use efficiency was so low. So I'm going to go out into the field here with a spade and we're going to, we're going to have a bit of a chat about what's going on and what we need to do differently. So I'm uh, out in the paddock here. It's a bit frosty actually. <laughs> Yesterday it was snowing where I was. Um, so yeah, we'll hopefully be able to get into the ground or right here. But like when I'm speaking at events and, and to groups, one thing I always hammer on about is that every farmer should have a good spade and a, and a soil thermometer. So if you haven't got one of those, uh, you need to equip yourself with one. Um, so yeah, just out in the paddock here, it's got reasonably good cover. Uh, there is pretty much no clover out here. Um, for a paddock like this, like these, these guys would be growing probably 14, 15 tonne of dry matter per hectare. My, my target for uh, paddocks that don't have a lot of clover would be to get down to about 10 kilos of nitrogen per tonne of dry matter grown, right? So if you're, if you're only growing 10 tonne of dry matter, you shouldn't need to use any more than 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. If you're growing 14 tonne, then you shouldn't need to use any more than around 140 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. If you get good active clover at good percentages in your sword, you can reduce those levels dramatically. But even without clover, there's a lot of opportunity to use our, our slurry. Uh, obviously, animals are housed in, in this country and um, we produce a lot of slurry so wise slurry use is a, is a huge area um, we can do a lot with looking at what happens with fungi and bacteria and i'm, I'm doing trials and, and i'll be looking at those sort of things next year a little bit more um, and uh, foliar nitrogen use so i'm going to be doing a segment or two on foliar nitrogen use so when we use foliar as in we, we just mix our urea diluted into water. Um, it's just mixing mixing urea up until it dissolves. And, and we add a humate, so an organic form, a humic acid to it. Um, that stabilizes it much more effectively than what, what, what is done using protected urea. Um, and, and we stabilize that product and we can get much greater efficiency uh, from the nitrogen that we use. So, uh, I'll be looking at protected urea through the series as well because it's something that I have an issue with and that we're using a carcinogenic 
uh, especially MBPT, which is the most commonly used urease protector in, in urea. Uh, it's a carcinogenic chemical that I, I do believe has side effects in actually decreasing the, the nitrogen conversion efficiency. So, you know, we're applying a product with a chemical that is massively reducing our uh, nitrous oxide and ammonia emissions. But then on the other hand, there is there are some really big downsides with that. So I'm, I'm hoping to speak with some, some um, experts that will give us some detail on that later on. And, and it's, it's, we have to be doing something. We have to be reducing our ammonia and our nitrous oxide emissions. But on the other hand, we don't want to be applying products to our soil that are going to have a long-term detrimental effect as well. Um, so looking back at 2023 and looking at what... Uh, went on in a lot of cases these clients that I've been working with that have really reduced their nitrogen use I'd be coming along and going no you need to apply a little bit more nitrogen you know we need to be going at 1.2 to even 1.5 times uh, the rate that we went on at the same time last year because the nitrogen use efficiency was down so much from 2022 and and you know why was that oh, actually from 2023 this is 2024. So um, you know, we need to look, look at why that is because it's a, it's a massively important element of, of understanding nitrogen so that when you're going through every year, you understand in the different conditions how you can manipulate the rates that you're applying. So we're gonna dig this hole here. So when we dig a hole, we're tempted to do um, cut four sides but what I always say is you cut three sides and lift it out all right and then you try and break off the fourth side because without putting the spades through it it allows you to really look at what's happening in the soil profile so now when we look at this um, this is torn off and down here it's interesting because we've got lovely crumbly soil and it's all looking looking uh, fairly um, loose. Uh, actually, this this soil is not too bad because even the top end is actually looking like we got fairly loose soils. Now, the big thing in 2024 was that in a lot of cases, when we looked at this top layer, it was completely compacted. And one of the big things we never talk about is the importance of airing a soil. So gas exchange. And an efficient nutrient exchange relies on having good oxygen transition through the soil. So as soon as you expel the air out of the soil, you lose that efficiency of nutrient exchange. So what happened in 2024 in that really poor spring is that we tried to get out and get cows to graze um, in fairly marginal, at best, conditions. So when we get cows out in marginal conditions, obviously you're going to be doing a fair bit of compaction. And even if you weren't out grazing, the continuous rain and moisture on the top surface of that soil meant that, um, that the soil breaks into little wee particles and settles together and it expels the ability of air to move through the soil. And when I went back to New Zealand in 2020 and bought our own farm and went farming ourselves, the big difference we found is that we were working with really aerobic conditions and that's something really important to understand is that in Ireland and most parts of the UK a lot of the time we're dealing with anaerobic conditions. So anaerobic conditions don't allow efficient nutrient exchange and it doesn't allow um, the, the root system to recover as quick as what it would as if there was oxygen in the soil. So the big question is how do we fix that? <laughs> in 2024 in an ideal world we should have had a bit of a dry spell because in a dry spell you get all that cracking and it introduces air into the soil and it, and it accelerates that that fixing of that that um, that issue but that never happened because basically it just rained all year um, and then um, now now this is what we need like it's lovely crisp days and frosty mornings um, if we get quite a good drier winter with a lot of crispy mornings will put ourselves in a way better position again for 2025 where we should start the year with soil in a much better position so 
come January, I'm going to be looking at um, what we can do for nitrogen application in the spring to um, get greater nitrogen response and what we do with slurry and what we do with nitrogen rates to ensure that we're minimizing, not minimizing, optimizing our nitrogen use. Because that's the whole thing, you know, like I'm not talking about minimizing nitrogen use. If you want to minimize nitrogen use, then just don't apply any. We want to optimize nitrogen use. We want to make sure that we continue to grow high volumes of quality dry matter, but that we're not compromising growth by reducing our nitrogen to, um, to lower levels. A lot of the time what happens, and, and what's happened in the past in Ireland especially, is that we create a complete drug addict in the front end of the year. We're applying way too much nitrogen earlier on. Like when your soil temperatures are still low, and your growth rates are really low in February, um, your nitrogen response is, is really poor, and it takes a long time for your nitrogen response to come through. So the plant may only be able to mobilize 0.1 to 0.2 kilos of nitrogen per hectare per day. So what that means is that every kilo of nitrogen you apply takes five to 10 days to be used by the plant. So if we go on with, you know, in the past, I saw people go on with like 50 kilos of nitrogen, like a, a bag of urea per acre in, in, the, in the old terms, like 50 kilos of nitrogen that's enough for 500 days in some cases at that kind of mobilization rate. So there's no wonder we had massive losses, all right? So this, this is an area where we, this is low hanging fruit. This is the area where we can have the greatest impact on our nitrogen use, is looking at making sure that we're applying the right rates of nitrogen at the right time to ensure we don't have losses. Like the Chagas figures at the moment, it, Ireland is running at somewhere around 27 to 28 percent nitrogen use efficiency. I mean that is that is an area that has so much scope to improve. If we're only uh, using 27 to 28 percent of the nitrogen we apply, we're losing the rest either in volatilization emissions or in leaching. So we have to get a hold on reducing that that. Um, nitrous oxide and ammonia emission and the leaching side of it because uh, for, for one environmentally for two the biggest thing is that you're throwing a lot of money at it and if we can get double the rate of return on that expenditure it just makes complete economic sense so it's a win-win um, there's a lot to look at uh, we need to look at how we're going to get oxygen into the soil in different situations and we need to look at uh, what happens with uh, calcium, magnesium ratios and all those sorts of things. So as the series goes on I'll be looking at those things and explaining these things a little bit more but obviously now we're not applying any nitrogen at the moment so um, it's just looking back in January I'll be looking at, at what happens at that point and especially taking into consideration what's happened through the winter by that time because we don't know what's going to happen and we need to make our decisions a little bit differently depending on the conditions at that time. So I hope you follow along um, and, uh, and learn a, a few things about what we're doing with our nutrient use. Another indicator of anaerobic conditions is uh, when you're walking through your paddocks and you're looking at the little open spots in the in the ground between the grass and you see a lot of moss. Now moss loves anaerobic conditions. Now often it's also an indicator of low pH. And if there's one area of low hanging fruit to improve our nitrogen efficiency, it's making sure that your pH is in the right zone. Now everything operates at an optimal zone of 6.4 pH. So, you know, when you, when you test plant sap, ideally you want it in 6.4, the soil at 6.4, you know, everything lives in an optimal zone at that level. So if your pH is sitting below 6, your nitrogen efficiency may be sitting at close to 50% of what it could be if you're sitting in an optimal zone for pH. So it's, it's a massive area that you need to look at. So the other thing is that when you're applying a lime, it's usually in a calcium lime form. So calcium 
as a as a as a mineral sort of pushes soil particles apart and allows the air to move between the, the pores and it also is kind of the trucker of all the other minerals and that um, calcium is really important in the other nutrient mobility and therefore having having really good pH and having applied your good calcium lime can make a big difference to your nitrogen efficiency. Now I've just come into this other paddock here I'm going to dig another hole because I think this paddock has actually been one of the last ones grazed um, so it's actually done a very good job of grazing so I'm not expecting to find a, a huge difference but it'll be interesting to see what what's happened here uh, with grazing in in probably the middle of November and seeing what impact that's had on the soil when we dig a hole so let's have a look at that nice clover plant there so we really hit the right right area where we look at uh, the clover plant and what it does so again we're not going very deep here but still very much uh, the soil is friable enough but you know we could do with a lot more oxygen transition through that because we can see that all the little small soil particles are just settled together in that top end. Now the other thing that clover does, and this is what I'm talking about, all the other benefits of clover, is that it actually pulls the soil into a different structure around the roots. Which means that you get greater water infiltration when you get high water, um, high rainfall. But it also means that when you go into dry spells, it has more efficient water retention, right? So your soil will hold on to more water to be available through dry spells. So clover is a wonderful plant like that, that um, it provides a lot of benefits other than just nitrogen mobilization from the atmosphere. Um, overall, this farm produces a lot of dry matter uh, because they really mine the soils in the spring. So it's run at a higher stocking level where uh, they, they do house cows when the conditions are poor and make sure that they really mine the soils and they use on-off grazing to try and minimize the damage that's done in the spring but it, it's, it's a soil that allows for a little bit more um, uh, use in the spring than what a lot of other farms do in, in, in Ireland so look that's the thing every, every place is different and every place needs different treatment and so um, you know hopefully I'll cover a lot of the different things through the series so yeah thanks for watching